Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Mark Martin. Here are some of the big headlines that we're following in the CBN newsroom. Hundreds of people gathered Sunday night to pray for those killed by the mudslides in Southern California. At least 20 people are dead and four more are still listed as missing. One prayer vigil was held in Santa Barbara. People carried flowers, lit candles, and prayed for the families who lost loved ones. Meanwhile, crews are working to remove piles of mud and debris off the roadways. Passengers aboard a commercial plane in Turkey say it is a miracle they survived after the plane landed on a cliff. It was a heart-stopping moment for the passengers and crew on the Boeing 737 traveling from Ankara. Video shows the aircraft on its belly dangling feet above the water. If the plane would have slid any further, it would have likely plunged into the Black Sea. A 7.1 earthquake hit off the course of actually off the coast of Peru early Sunday. At least 65 people are seriously hurt and one person has died. There are also reports of power outages and damaged buildings. A federal judge in Nevada released hundreds of pages of FBI documents about the Las Vegas shooting massacre. The documents reveal gunman Stephen Paddock exchanged emails about buying rifles and bump stocks months before he killed 58 people and wounded 500 from a hotel in October. Investigators suspect Paddock may have been emailing himself, but they don't know why. The documents were released in response to several media lawsuits, and we'll have more on some of these stories later in the show at CBNNews.com. Federal and local officials are reviewing the emergency alarm system after a major scare for the people of Hawaii this weekend. Saturday morning, they were alerted about an incoming ballistic missile that turned out to be a hoax. Now the government is working to avoid that mistake in the future and that the system works right if there is a real threat someday. CBN's Jenna Browder has the story and President Trump's reaction from Washington. A false incoming missile alert. The U.S. Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. Sent Hawaii into a panic Saturday morning. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. The scare had people running for shelter, some filing into bunkers, others hunkering down in basements, fearing the worst. Because of what's been going on in North Korea and things, you know, it, uh, I tended to take it seriously at first. The mistake took 38 minutes to correct. Though officials realized it was a mistake within the first few minutes. They're now reviewing the emergency alarm system, and the worker who accidentally hit the wrong button has been reassigned. President Trump praised Hawaii officials for accepting responsibility. We're going to get involved. They took responsibility. They made a mistake. This all comes as tensions continue to grow with North Korea's Kim Jong-un and his threats of a nuclear attack. Kim Jong-un was the happiest guy in the world yesterday because his nuclear program has done what he wanted it to do, and that is be able to strike fear in the hearts of the American people. The goal now for local and federal officials is to make sure this doesn't happen again. The fact that it took so long for them to put out that second message to calm people, to allay their fears, that this was a mistake, a false alarm, is something that has to be fixed. The FCC is also now launching its own investigation, saying Hawaii did not have reasonable safeguards in place. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. The war of words continues over Trump's alleged remarks about S-hole countries. Speaking from his Florida Beach Club, the president denies he made vulgar and offensive comments about Haiti and Africa in the Oval Office. Two GOP senators say he did not say it, while GOP Senator Lindsey Graham says the account is basically accurate. President Trump continues to deny accusations of racism. No, no, I'm not a racist. I am the least racist. Trump says he thinks the DACA deal is probably dead because he says Democrats don't really want it. Israel destroyed a Hamas tunnel that ran from Gaza to Israel and Egypt and vows to destroy all tunnels by the end of the year. The tunnels are used by Hamas to smuggle in weapons and have also been used to launch attacks inside Israel. Israeli officials say they've developed new ways to detect the tunnels and have destroyed three in the past two months. Israel is constructing an underground wall complete with sensors along the 36-mile Gaza border.
The deadly Palestinian practice called pay to slay is in the news once again after the brutal killing of an Israeli father of six. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu praised the U.S. ambassador to Israel after he said that the Palestinian Authority policy of paying terrorists is the reason there is no peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Jerusalem. Nearly $3,000. That's what Palestinian killers of an Israeli rabbi will likely receive from their government under what's known as pay to slay. 35-year-old Rabbi Raziel Shevach died following a drive-by shooting near his home in Samaria. The terror attack drew quick condemnation from U.S. Ambassador David Friedman, who tweeted, An Israeli father of six was killed last night in cold blood by Palestinian terrorists. Hamas praises the killers, and PA laws will provide them financial rewards. Look no further to why there is no peace. I want to congratulate Ambassador Friedman, the American ambassador to Israel, who tweeted the truth, unvarnished, straightforward. The important thing is that uh, Abbas's uh, government is supporting the kind of murderers that murdered the father of six. Congress is also targeting the policy with the Taylor Force Act. The bill, which has already passed the House, would withhold U.S. tax dollars from the Palestinian Authority unless it stops paying those who kill Israelis. Such people in our jails get $355 million a year, they and their families, from the Palestinian Authority. That is something that is untenable. According to figures released by the Israel Defense Ministry, the rabbi's killers will likely receive a salary five times the average Palestinian wage for the rest of their lives. Palestinian Authority records show the more serious the crime, the higher the pay. For example, a terrorist sentence to three to five years receives $580 per month. For a sentence carrying 20 to 35 years in prison, the monthly pay grows to almost 3,000. There are also bonuses ranging from $87 for a married terrorist to $145 for an Israeli Arab carrying out an attack. Funding and incentivizing murder doesn't exactly advance peace. Here's the principle they're communicating to their people. Kill an Israeli and get rich. Now, what kind of message does that send to impressionable Palestinian children? President Trump also recently threatened to cut funding to another Palestinian institution, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. It's not a question of defunding UNRWA. It's a question of replacing UNRWA with, after 70 years, with a, an agency that will actually address the real needs of real refugees. Since there is an overall UN effort for millions of refugees worldwide, Netanyahu sees no reason for Palestinians to receive individual attention. This will not have negative effects, it will have positive effects because the perpetuation of the dream of bringing the descendants of refugees back to Jaffa is what sustains this conflict. UNRWA is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, fighting abortion. See how this woman is using her personal experience to save the lives of the unborn. Welcome back. The woman in our next story is now a top pro-life leader, but when she was an unmarried pregnant teenager, she decided abortion was her only option until she suffered through a terrible experience on the abortion table. Paul Strand brings us her story. Catherine Glenn Foster is a wife and mom who also leads Americans United for Life one of the premier organizations fighting abortion. Babies are saved. Millions of babies have been saved by our work. For her, this isn't political, it's personal. Because Catherine herself suffered an horrific experience at an abortion clinic almost two decades ago. When I was 19 years old, I had an unintended pregnancy. I felt incredibly alone. I thought it really was, um, it was just me trying to, uh, trying to figure out what to do and, and salvage my life. The theme for this year's March for Life on January 19th is Love Saves Lives. Maybe someone to really love and stand with Catherine 
could have saved her from what happened next, but no such person came alongside her. So I went online, uh, found the second cheapest abortion center I could, made an appointment for that Saturday because I knew that I couldn't wait any longer. I, I wouldn't have had it in me. I, I was already bonding. She certainly didn't feel like a liberated woman exercising her reproductive freedom, making a pro-choice decision. Went into that center um, because I thought I had no choice. I thought I had no other option and I was terrified. What I found there was uh, coercion, lack of information, at times outright lies, um, at times force. As the abortion was about to begin, uh, I asked to get up. Um, I, I said, please let me up, let me off this table, out of this room. I don't want this anymore. Foster first described the shocking experience that followed to CBN News a year ago at a protest outside a Planned Parenthood building. And I said, no, I, I can't do this. You know, this is wrong. I feel really bad about this. Let me just go. You can keep the money. And they shouted for more people. And I had four people holding me down. One, uh, a, a nurse, a staff member on each arm. The doctor aborted my child. I'm screaming. You know, it was, that's not choice. It was not pro-woman, it was not pro-me, they didn't listen to me, they did not care about me, they didn't respect my opinion, they, they were just in and out, they wanted me gone, and they wanted my baby gone. Now in the present, Catherine still can feel the grief and guilt of that day so many years ago. In the end, I was left alone in the recovery room, um, wishing that I could turn back time and just go in an hour, a week, a month, back in time and, redo everything. It took me a long time to recover, uh, physically and then uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It was, um, it was devastating. But Catherine pushed on, finished college, then law school. She wed, had kids, and because of what happened to her at that clinic, she took up pro-life legal work and eventually the presidency of Americans United for Life. Where we work in the legislatures, in the courts, in the culture, to make sure that other women don't have to go through what I went through. She's particularly proud of one state law championed by her group. The state of Wyoming, just last session, passed its first pro-life law in 28 years. And that law is an ultrasound requirement. Meaning if an abortion center records an ultrasound with a patient and she asks to see it, they must show her the baby's image which didn't happen for 19-year-old Catherine. That's part of my story, because I was there in the center and asked to see my child's ultrasound. And I asked, and I was refused. Wow. They said no. And that's always haunted me. I've always wanted and, and wished again that I could go back. Um, and knowing that women in Wyoming now have that right is so impactful. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. What an amazing testimony she has. Well, up next, we're looking into the not-so-sweet facts about artificial sweeteners. Thanks for staying with us. If you drink or eat anything with artificial sweeteners, you might want to reconsider. New research shows they can hurt our brains and heart. And believe it or not, don't even help us lose weight. Lori Johnson has the story. This country's weight problem is only getting worse. The CDC reports a staggering 71% of adults qualifies as overweight or obese. The result? Things like heart disease, cancer, diabetes. In June, the New England Journal of Medicine reported the whole world is getting fatter and paying a price, 4 million deaths, 60% caused by obesity, but the other 40% by just being overweight. Health experts say the root cause of our weight problem can be summed up in one word, sugar. Most Americans consume about 160 pounds of it a year. Oftentimes, it's hidden in foods you'd never expect, like yogurt, peanut butter, pasta sauce, and bread. Then other times, it's right out front, like in soda. This one can contains more than nine teaspoons of sugar. It's no wonder so many people turn to diet sodas containing zero-calorie artificial sweeteners to reduce their sugar intake. But that's a bad choice for a number of reasons. A new Boston University study revealed people who drank diet soda have three times the risk of developing dementia and having a stroke. 
and that's people who just drink one a day. So artificial sweeteners, we think, are much worse than we ever thought. The Cleveland Clinic's Dr. Michael Roizen says artificial sweeteners like aspartame, saccharin, and sucralose can disrupt what's known as our microbiome. Your microbiome is the bacteria inside your gut. Those artificial sweeteners cause a separate breed of bacteria to grow inside you. Neurologist David Perlmutter says artificial sweeteners throw off the delicate balance of good and bad bacteria. The bacteria that live within our gut nurture the brain when they're treated right. They reduce inflammation, for example. Inflammation is the key player that causes multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and even Alzheimer's, and coronary artery disease, and diabetes for that matter. As well. Perlmutter says in addition to avoiding artificial sweeteners, consider taking probiotics to increase good bacteria and prebiotics to maintain healthy levels. We consume artificial sweeteners to control our weight, but believe it or not, a number of scientific studies show they actually cause us to gain weight. One reason goes right back to the gut. The body thinks it's starving and holds on to every calorie that a person consumes. So here are people consuming diet drinks and gaining weight. And that doesn't seem to make any sense. And yet we now see those, uh, that it's happening uh, because of changes in the gut bacteria. The risk of developing diabetes is dramatically increased twofold in people who drink a lot of sugarless beverages. Who knew? Nutritionist J.J. Virgin says the artificial sweeteners stevia, xylitol, erythritol, and monk fruit appear to be better choices for the gut. However, they can still lead to weight gain. But there's also a phenomenon that happens called calorie dysregulation that they saw with artificial sweeteners. When you eat, a, eat something that's got a sweet taste with no calories, your body can't calibrate the degree of sweetness with how many calories, so it causes you to tend to overeat. Then there's our own DNA. Genetics predispose an estimated three-fourths of us to have an addiction to sweets, meaning the more we take in artificial sweeteners, the more we crave all sweets. That's why health experts recommend removing the taste for sweets altogether. Sweet is a learned taste. If you go off sweet, if you go off sugar, if your brain doesn't get used to it, if your taste buds don't get used to it, you can avoid it, and that's a much healthier state. Virgin proved this theory with 700 sugar addicts. First, we taper down for a week. We don't cook cold turkey, but then we lower their sugar impact down. We start using more spices and more savory and getting enough protein in and getting healthy fats in. And then at the end of two weeks, we go back and test. And these sugar addicts told me that sweet food just tasted gross. So while eating too much sugar is definitely hazardous, artificial sweeteners can be just as bad for you, maybe worse. That's why the healthiest solution is to remove all sweets from your diet, both real and fake. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Wow, a lot of good information there. Thank you, Lori. Well, we'll be right back with more of CBN Newswatch. Don't go away. Joel Taylor, CEO of Bethel Music Group, says his son Jackson is walking again and on the road to recovery. Taylor took to Instagram with a call to prayer first for his son Jackson, then his daughter Addie when they became seriously ill. Taylor and his wife Janie faced the unbelievable when both of their children were hospitalized with E. coli. Two-year-old Jackson got even sicker as it turned into something called HUS. Four-year-old Addie is out of the hospital and even got to go on a date with her dad. Jackson is still hospitalized with weak kidneys, but Taylor told CBN News doctors say he's getting better and may be going home soon. Taylor says he knows God brought Jack Jackson through the worst of it. I've never seen anything like it. It's, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been, have been praying for us, and we don't even know how because we don't even have that many friends, that's for sure. But God's been using this as a miracle, as testimony to the whole world, we feel. And so we're just uh, staying strong with our faith, and we've never lost our trust in God. Um, I just feel like when our prayers, when we ran out of tears and prayers, um, the world really stepped in and prayed for us. 
You can find the full interview on the Taylor's miraculous story at CBNnews.com. Operation Blessing provided free medical care this week to a remote community in Haiti that has no health care facilities. A team of doctors, pharmacists, and nurses conducted a two-day medical mission where they were able to help more than 600 adults and children with a variety of issues. Well, that's going to do it for today's CBN News Watch. Have a great day.